thank you. I'm Michael Eager. I'm the chair of the Dwarf Debugging Format Standards Committee. Uh, I want to give you just uh, a couple things. Um, this is pretty informal. I want to talk about what we're doing for Dwarf 5, talk about a little bit of the history, and particularly about debugging optimized code, talk about um, the title, which is what GCC should tell GDB. And Dwarf is the vehicle for doing that. Um, so interrupt me when, when you want to, and um, we'll take it from there. Uh, every, every version of Dwarf, we add some support for new languages. I think the most significant parts that we've added uh, for Dwarf version 5 are in Fortran, uh, co-arrays, assumed rank arrays. You can't ask me what that means. Um, we've given definitions for, for some languages. We've also cleaned up some descriptions of variables so that string size, um, there are different ways of implementing variable length strings. We were a little confused about what we, how we describe that. So we've sorted that out. Uh, we've also allowed you to specify exactly what the character type is. These are pretty trivial things. We've included um, some better, um, better ways to describe where variables are located, such as implicit pointers, which are, which are data which is actually in your program and available, except the pointer which addresses it no longer is available. And we've now um, uh, got a, a way to do that. Uh, we're going to have uh, some ways of identifying where uh, function entry values should be captured so that we, we can have that data available. Next big thing that we have is to reduce the size of the debug data. And a couple of things are, one of them is that we've got an improved uh, method for describing macros. The previous method was pretty crude and uh, pretty bulky, and we've, we've come up with a better way. Um, folks at Google have been working on debug fission, which is separating the debug from, from the executable, keeping it in the object files, so that you only read the debug information when you need to, which is a good idea. Um, some other things in Dwarf 5 coming up. We have improved access to the Dwarf data, such as pub names and type names, uh, using a hashed access scheme. Um, we've got some improved uh, identification of, uh, improved description of code, uh, so we can identify call sites. So those are good things. If you want information about, about Dwarf, go to www dwarfstandard.org, you'll find the, the standard, you'll find a list of open issues, you'll find a list of issues that we've resolved and accepted or modified. Hi there. Um, if you're new to Dwarf, you'll find a paper that I wrote about um, an introduction to Dwarf, give you some of the high level concepts. Really a lot easier than reading the standard. The standard is designed to be Hey, <laughs> thank you. That, that's, a, that's a good word. The, the, the standard is deci de designed to be precise, and it's only opaque as a side effect. So um, my guess is that we will have a release of Dwarf 5 next year. Should, should be. Depends on it, what, what new proposals we come up with. Um, let's talk about debugging optimized code. Now, Carolyn Tice, raise your hand. Mm -hmm. Carolyn Tice wrote a PhD thesis uh, on debugging optimized code about 15 years ago. So I quoted a couple of parts uh, of what she wrote then. Now, 15 years ago, we had 
Dwarf version 2, which was released in 92. Okay. And the big problems 15 years ago were where to set breakpoints in a way that made sense to the user and where to find data. And as she mentions in her, her thesis, there was more research on where to find data than there was on, on, uh, on mapping the source lines to the object and, and how to handle that problem. So this is, this is Dwarf 2. We've had Dwarf 3, which added location lists, which really did help in, in allowing a compiler to show where uh, data moved around as, as the PC value changes, which is good. We also improved a number of things in data description. So how are we today? People may not realize you changed the slide. Pardon me? People might not realize that you changed the slide. Oh, I think, it, I think it's entirely different. <laughs> okay, so the problems today are that when you set a breakpoint, you really don't know where it's going. You can't actually be sure that things that are before the breakpoint have actually occurred. If you put a breakpoint after a function call, I can't tell you whether the function has been called or not. Um, there are some improvements in located data. Uh, the variable tracking in GCC is really nice because we actually do have some information. But every program I run, every time I'm stepping through things, every variable I look at isn't there. Okay, so. We've come a long way in 15 years. You should use your variables more. I should what? Use your variables more. <laughs> They're not there, it's because they must be. Uh, the other alternative is to mark everything volatile. <laughs> um, okay, so we, we, we have some, we, there are issues with debugging optimized code. So let me kick off with some things. What should GCC tell GDB, or what should any compiler tell any debugger? First of all, tell the truth. Um, how, many, how many of you have found that debugger lies to you? Okay, how many of you trust a debugger that lies to you? Okay. You, okay. Yeah, okay. So debuggers can't tell the truth unless the compiler tells the truth. And a debugger that, that is giving you the value of a variable stored in memory when the value is actually in a register in a loop, it, this, isn't, this isn't helpful. This is misleading. Um, some of the bugs I've chased down in GDB, um, well, half of the bugs I chased down in GDB are really somewhere else. They're bad code generation, bad linkage, bad dwarf, bad this, bad that. Uh, some things in, in GCC, you just can't, you know, I, I look at the dwarf, the dwarf is wrong, I look in GCC to find out, well, GCC doesn't generate the right stuff because it can't, so it generates the wrong stuff. Okay, so, um, so first of all, tell the truth. Next thing is, tell the whole truth. Uh, how many of you use macros in your programming? How many of you use macros in your debugging? You actually have a debugger and it will actually show you the macros. Yeah. And it works, okay. Um, Okay, I've uh, limited experience using macros in GDB because most of the time the compiler doesn't generate the macro information because the macro information is bulky, and you, do have to G3. you have to specify G3 and, and it's huge, and it's huge. And it's but huge. It's still worth it. 
Okay. We should be we should be generating macro information that's usable um, frequently in debugging stuff in in um, GCC. I want to see the both the source file for a dot like the .md file, and I want to see the generated file. Uh, Dwarf doesn't have any way of telling you that relationship. I'm not sure that the compiler has a way of telling you the relationship. So I end up eliminating all the line variables, recompiling without you know, without dot o, without dash o, and I have a process. It works. It's just not very good. Um, I've run into some times when compilers don't generate code because it would don't generate dwarf because it would make the dwarf larger. Okay, um, there's nothing in the dwarf standard that says you have to do anything particularly uh, to generate dwarf. You don't have to do any. You don't have to generate this or that. The other. These are quality of implementation issues, and. You know, poor implementations are hard to use. You could set so, up a quality program. pardon me. You could set up a quality program. Thank you for volunteering. You disapproved? No, no, it'd be something you could run. Compiler uh, is disapproved. Big check mark. <laughs> Certified by Mike. <laughs> okay. Mikey likes it. Hmm? Mikey likes it. Um. And then the third thing is tell nothing but the truth. And I've seen some, I've seen some compilers that generate dwarf that I don't know what all that stuff is doing, but you don't need all of it to, to express it. So really, describe everything that's going on in your program. Don't describe things that, that don't matter. Um, anyway. Um, Yeah, absolutely. Uh, telling some, telling the user where the variable used to be, may not be the most important important thing or useful thing. And I mean, and in particular, it's misleading, and uh, it's helpful in the context of how bad this stuff is to think about uh, not just this is what GCC is telling you to be, but this is also what the, what GCC is telling uh, system to have whatever other kind of things things that. See, you know, if GDB lies to me, it looks funny, it smells funny, I don't trust it. I, you know, I step again and ask again, or I disassemble and I figure it out. But that's not the only use of dwarf, is interactive debugging where you have a, where at the end of the day you have a human second guessing everything. Uh, it's also really quite useful to use it in sort of pure, there's no humans involved kind of situation. Batch mode, it's generated. Um, you want to use this for you know, tracing kinds of stuff, whatever, where, um, where if the tool says, I can't figure that out right now, that's you know acceptable. It's a you know, less than ideal quality implementation. But if the tool says, I've been told to look off you know, into the deep blue sea and tell you some random lie, then that just makes the whole thing it, absolutely. I'd rather be told I don't know and be disappointed than being told, you know, tell me a story. Absolutely. Um, what, what are your thoughts? Um, what else should, okay, we look at what, what Dwarf is doing right now. We say that compilers are not using it as well as it could. 
what can Dwarf be doing better so that compiler writers, you know, GCC developers can use it better so that people can debug better? One thing that's been a little bit unclear to me is that there's some of these optimization techniques that we've about in the past where, say, supply enough instructions in the, you know, they have the compiler supply enough instructions to recreate the values of dead variables. Ideas like using the bike codes for and that kind of stuff. Um, but I don't really see much of that in real life. And it's never been more to say clear to me whether it's something that Dwarf could do as is, or if there's some fundamentally missing thing that's really just ECC or laziness that. Is that I'm sorry, say it again. Uh, Roland? You know about stack values at Dwarf 4 or 3? If you if you're talking about synthesizing values which have been optimized out, I don't dwarf I think can can support that. Where? Oh, okay. I haven't. Okay. Uh, for The, the variable tracking really does help. What I don't, what I don't see is when um, loop variables have been eliminated, those can almost, those can frequently be synthesized. I don't see them being synthesized. They're converted to a pointer reference, and it's a computation. And I don't see that computation. But maybe they're, you know, okay, if, it's if, if it's doing more, I'm happy. Always, there are test cases which show okay, we, we can we don't generate anything, and and in theory we could, then we can improve this. Okay, I, I truly sure like to see see examples of that because I'm frankly I'm going on on what I have seen while debugging, and yeah, rather than rather than creating a test case to see what what happens in others. So, um, one, of the, one of the problems is that people writing optimizations don't realize that they need to keep around information for debugging. So I think they tend to lose the information. I'm not sure that they had the information coming in that would be necessary for debugging either. So that's... Well, in this case, it's, it's like it's done, but you know, there's no GCC blog. So nobody knows about it. Okay. If you really want to do debugging of optimized code, one of the problems, I, I'm not sure it's ever been across back in a while, but one thing that was missing in Dwarf before is the fact that you really no longer have a one-to-one -one location mapping. So it's not like you have one source code line corresponds to one instruction set of instructions. You have multiple source lines corresponding to multiple sets of instructions. So like I, I had a problem um, where I got a report that there was a bug in GDB because um, it was reporting that an error happened at one location, and the error really happened at another location. And I went to explore it, and what happened was that the compiler had collapsed the two locations and reused the same bit of code. And there was no way for the compiler to tell the debugger that this code actually corresponded to two different source lines. So it just had to randomly pick one and say, okay, this is the source line that this code corresponds to. And there, so yeah, there needs to be a way, if you really want to do accurate information, to reflect that a bit of code could have come from multiple source lines, or a single source line could be responsible for, you know, keys three different places where the loop was unrolled, for example. So, okay. So, in, so, and so this is saying, Carrie and I were talking to Michael about this yesterday. Yeah. Um, the problem ends up being, like, if you're looking at the line table coming in, um, you have to know which, before you come into a particular address range that could have been merged, assuming some way of knowing that this has been merged and it could be one of these three things, you need to know what PC value you came into there from. So one of the things was like, you know, maybe GDB could end up uh, putting a, um, an internal hidden breakpoint right before those kinds of blocks and then knowing, okay, this is my PC, 
and then we'll, we would need to modify the line table to say, all right, if you came in here from this PC, you're actually at this line, this PC, you're at this line, this PC, you're at this line, and that's about, about, about the only way to I, well, Do you have any better ideas, Stan? Well, I didn't think so. At the very <laughs> In the spirit of telling the whole truth, you could just say, well, I don't know which line, but I do know it was one of these two. That's true. You could say saying it was this line. You, you can do this work. and go, it's what? We, we, say, we can, we can certainly. it's one of these two lines, but I can't tell you which one. That would be better. That's better than saying it's this one. What? We could, we could easily say, we could easily say, Instead of saying this PC corresponds to this line, we could say this PC corresponds to this collection of lines, yeah. and um, and and we do this more or less in the debugger when you have you know overloaded functions or inline code which appears at several places. We say stopping at this function stops at these different locations. Well, it's this per and and this is just this is the opposite. Um, but, but dwarf can support it, although the spec doesn't necessarily say how. We sort of extend it in the HPUX compilers, we extended it so that we could support the idea of uh, one instruction belonging to multiple lines. So okay. it, it, it can be done, but Dwarf doesn't really say how to do it yet. Really? If you set up a sign table, then you say commit, and if you just leave the PC unchanged and add another line and say commit again, yeah. but Oops. to me it's all this would be the obvious way. It was a straightforward way to do it, but I don't think the spec um, makes it clear that that's the way to do it. Okay. okay. That that's legal. Okay. Oops. Um, I think you also had the idea of you were calling it a, a two-level line table. I would call it a reverse line table. That um, in our current line table translates PC to source. So that if you get a, a breakpoint at a PC, you know what the source is. To set a breakpoint, we we do something a little bit different. Um, try to figure out what that is, and we maybe set several breakpoints for a source line. Um, and I've lost the reason for the other the other table. Oh, to be able to step to efficiently step through code. Yeah. One thing GCC doesn't do well now with the line table is set the is statement play. Basically sets is statement for every instruction. Um, so when you step when you single step through, you hop around. It is It is no longer reasonable to automatically use the first instruction for a statement as its breakpoint location. Where have I heard that before? I don't know that I agree with that one though. Because what if you want to examine each of your arguments being set up for a function call? Do it before the function. Do it before the function is called. After the arguments are... Foo, yeah, there's bar, baz. It, you can put in, in innumerable, innumerable things on a single line. Now, if GDP the, starts supporting column information, that would be that, a good step that, forward. That, that might help. <laughs> that might help. But, but really... The, the, the majority case, okay, first of all, there are lots and lots of corner cases where what you really need to do is look at the assembly code and step through single step. So let's not, let's not treat that as the standard of what, what right. people want to do. Right, but if you but, don't, then if you're but, looking at a single line, you could be halfway through that line, you don't know what's going, you don't know which, which, any, which of your variables happens to have a value in it. But the point that you want is a significant point, and on a function call, generally the significant point is either um, before you have evaluated any of the arguments or after you have evaluated all the arguments before a call. I think after, after is probably what I would think is the best. Well, I'd like to see that's some real... Well, maybe this is corner cases, but those in corner cases, I guess, that's where you're There is always an instruction where you do a call. And uh, unless you're, uh, I'm, I'm not talking about inline. Pardon me? There could be a, a delay, so delay slot after the call in which you compute one of the arguments. An instruction Th those are called corner cases. 
That that really that really is the exact example of where you need to look at the at the. Someone who worked on this for years. That's called bad architecture design. Oh, uh, I I know many many. In, 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 in the work here that he was quoting, what I was saying was that um, you you would need more than one breakpoint per per line. You would need a you breakpoint might need. at every significant program event, basically every state changing event. So you need a breakpoint whenever a variable got changed, you need a breakpoint whenever a parameter got changed, you need a breakpoint whenever you're going to change, you know, do a jump in the control flow. And so, but just because you needed a break for each of these events, does it mean that the correct place to break was the first instruction that started setting up this event? Um, you'd want to break when you were actually changing the, the, the memory location. You'd have to break when you were actually updating the register, not when you were starting to read where the variable was for the first time before you did the update or something like that. You know, low, low for example, you don't need to break it for prefetch instructions. You have to move way up to the top. Exactly. Yeah. 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 You'd, want to, you'd want to break for every important event, and you'd want to pick which instruction was the appropriate one for the event to set the breakpoint on that instruction, which so, requires a lot of intelligence and heuristics. So the question I have here, this sort of follows this, how many people try to debug optimized code? How many people think it works well? For, for it, it, it really it depends, depends on what you need. Compared to what? I mean, it works so much better than it did, you know, five, six years ago before GTN and everything. So, and I mean, it works better well if you're happy to do it. So, I mean, I do, I do it, but I always have display slash five dollar PC just in case I need to understand the assembly there and you know to info address to. Uh, Figure out how much it's lying to me and how much I should look at Yeah, and I usually have an option. Sort of used to that for years. So. I have an obj dump sometimes sitting open, you know, disassembly and you know all this stuff. Um, it's it's better that nobody's denying that it has gotten better. I'm I'm trying to figure out how we get up to the point where I think we would agree that it's good. I don't think there are any test cases in GCC testing that verify that the correct debugging domain is. There are, there, are. there are some. There are some. They're not very well. What? There's quality. What? Yes. Yeah, I mean, there's quality. One thing that would help there is if you could add dependencies on the GCC test suite, can you say read off and dump the values? Yeah, there's what? an awful lot of X fails in quality. Yeah, I mean, and, and there's a lot of X fails. And expected, but not X fails. Mm -hmm. Well, but uh, what, what fails differs from one yeah. architecture to another one. So if you start marking everything X fail, then suddenly, mm -hmm. yeah, it's. I mean, at some point, at some point, a lot of debug info tests are going to be you know, almost impossible to test without specifying the architecture. There are only very very few things you can specify that way. Um, and I, that's probably the only way that quality will work. The other so generally, for an unoptimized code, it usually breaks on most architectures. Breaks or works? Breaks. Breaks. Well, uh, well o O0 has the a disadvantage that we don't track variables at all, so the UI uh, for O0. I, I ran the GCC test for debugging information a while ago. What I've, I'm not sure I remember it very well, but what I found was there are lots of tests that aren't, that are turned off. X fails or just not run. Then there are a lot of tests run with dash O, O0, um, which doesn't tell you how things work in real life. And they don't test very much. You know, they, they generate something, they invoke, uh, the test invokes GDB to see if it displayed a variable, and it exits. And that's, th this is sort of a smoke test. It really doesn't tell you how good it is, it tells you if it falls over. But we also run the GC compiler through the GDB test suite. Which is by far the best more. way of That probably testing. tests more. I mean, that's okay. There's a lot that that does not test. Mm -hmm. for, for what it's worth, if someone who's brought up a brought a compiler through the GDB test suite, yeah. it, it tests way more than you think. Okay. <laughs> 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 I do wish that I like, maybe even at O zero, it tests way more for, than you think. For a while, you know, we were working on this tool for Flynn 11, kind of recently, but that's the kind of thing where if you 
it would be nice if GCC tests were run in the output or run the war plant just to make sure it's GCC generating okay war and then war plant could be sort of tight to set the desired what is dwarf lint? It's just a tool. It's in a branch and help you tell for checking the dwarf. Hmm? It checks the structure. It checks the scale. Yeah, you wrote it. Um, okay. I don't think I've seen dwarf lint. Well, it's never been you know, released. Yeah. It's okay. It's just there. Uh, One yeah, uh, the, the uh, Apple version of their dwarf dumper has a verified it tests some things. It, it'll verify that you didn't completely screw up your debug information. Um, uh, somebody was asking me. Uh, uh, it will not check. It will not check the. It will not check the handshake between the compiler and the debugger, okay. though, and that's actually what you need the debugger right. testing for. But some you know, sort of like the first pass. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Kind of, I mean, it's sort of like. For, I mean, it, one thing it does is sort of you know the things that it but uh, it's also sort of. Yeah. You know, well formatted. Well formatted. Okay, well formatted. Uh, uh, which is really impressive how much not quite well formed stuff you see. That's interesting. Some, somebody, I, I was having an email conversation a week or so ago, and the person says, well, you can't tell, you know, you can't say this is invalid dwarf. My response was, the only thing that, the way the dwarf spec is written is permissive. It doesn't tell you what you have to do. It tells you, you know, what things mean when you say them. So the only thing that is invalid is stuff which is not well formed. Yeah, well, and so, and so Dwarf Lid does check a bit more so than that. It also checks not just things that are, you know, by the spec, not well formed work, but uh, it double does sort of check all those. Too much, it's too noisy. Yeah, we never got to do it. I mean, it, you know, it, it tries it. Lots of things that are, you know, obviously stupid as well. Okay. You know, we we've had. But it, but it, it, it can't. It doesn't attempt to enhance. Yeah. Without, you know, solving the whole problem of disassembling code and everything. That's uh, it can't check that it's we, correct for the program. It just checks that it's not the same. Yeah. I mean, one of the easy things to screw up is accidentally putting the AT declaration on a die and then adding all of the, and adding the rest of the attributes to it as well. And, you know, something that verifies that's actually kind of useful. Oh, okay. Things like yeah, that. yeah. Okay. That would be. Uh, we've had discussions in the past on the Dwarf Committee about writing up a document which, which either a language binding which says if you're writing C and you're doing this, generate this kind of dwarf. And um, we really didn't get a lot of traction for doing that. Um, it's, it's hard work. And what we also found was a lot of compilers do things somewhat idiosyncratically. Everybody does things that is sort of right, but not the same for some definition of right, which we get into arguments about. So, um, a lot of flexibility. Um, it's designed to be flexible. Uh, put in an attribute if you want to. Don't put it in if you don't want to. Don't, you know, if, if you don't put it in and your debugger lies to you, that is a quality of implementation issue. It only specifies how to produce valid for it. It really doesn't specify at all how to Right. Right. There's so much that's language specific. Like, how do you implement um, Lambdas, like how do you how, how do you implement you know how to find the implicit this in a lambda? Yeah. Um, yeah. So, um, looking back over uh, the history of Dwarf, was that permissiveness actually um, a good idea, or is this one of these things where maybe you want to strategically rethink it and do something like the difference? and be a little bit more restrictive to make it so that it is more testable that you can solve some of these problems as a strategic, strategic 
strategic evolutionary plan. I, mean, I, see, a, I see your point, but I, I think, and maybe Michael has a different perspective on this, but I think that the, one of the, the benefits of the permissive specification model is that this gets to, you know, we actually have a lot of independent producers and consumers uh, who do agree on what's in the dwarf spec with, you know, occasional corner issues and bugs and stupidities and whatever. Um, and that, on the one hand, it's not as useful as uh, a standard seems like it ought to be and that it doesn't really guarantee useful interoperation between my father and your mother. But on the other hand, if we try to get it to be, you know, an iron, ironclad, rigorous specification so that you could write a compiler producing this format and every debugger will be happy with you and, you know, vice versa, then I don't think we'd have, you know, maybe that would be fine for DTC and DB and we the room would be happy, but I don't think you would ever get any, you know, any other compiler projects and any other debugger projects to do it because then you have this, you know, infinite level of detail standardization process that has to be agreed upon by all these there, similar there, things there, that are what, what Roland's saying has a lot of truth to it. There's a lot, there's a number of standards for debugging formats. There's the IEEE 695, which once upon a time I knew a lot about and I don't remember anymore. But that was created um, and it was standardized. It's an IEEE standard. Nobody uses it because it's stuck at one point in time about 20 years ago and it's not extensible. Um, there's the cough format which has some defined debug information and there's 19 different kinds of cough. If you've ever worked with MIPS you know about four of them. Um, there's, there's stabs which I worked on at Sun a long time ago which also has variations. What, one of the things, one of the design goals for, for Dwarf is to be extensible. So we have uh, a lot of user extension ability. We have the ability to skip over things. A, 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 a debugger should be able to skip over things that it doesn't understand and hopefully muddle through. If you don't understand something, you're not going to display that information, but presumably you'll be able to display other stuff. Uh, sometimes better in, in theory than practice. Um, but this extensibility and the, and the looseness of the specification means that people can use it in novel ways for novel languages without going through a four-year standardization process to get somebody to say what the bit flag is over here that means, um, what was that? Uh, oh, uh, uh, co-arrays in Fortran, and that's a, a 17 in that field. So uh, there's a trade-off. I think otherwise we'd be able to 453 and you know, we'd you print out of, you know, which flag is used with which file. And, and just to sort of reinforce what, what Mike said, uh, I think that, the, so there's, there's ups and downs but I think the extensibility has all in all been a great success. Um, so we have, you know, there, you know, there is some sort of churn about it. We we have had more than one cases where case where we had, you know, the the GNU extension and the Sun extension and the HP extension that were all almost the same but used, you know, different different numbers. And then in for N plus one eventually we have a legacy issue for your existing products and everything. Yeah. But we have, you know, certainly since I've been worrying about it, which is just in the uh, four or three plus uh, era, um, you know, things that uh, most of the things that uh, even inside Fortran, you know, the other things that uh, Mike mentioned on the new things in Dwarf 5, largely I recognize as stuff that, that I or me had uh, came up with and they were GNU extensions and C 
start with, they were just prototype experiments, and we didn't have to mess with the whole ecosystem of tools to prototype that, or even to deploy it as an extension, like, you know, like, uh, it was a pointer um, that was uh, an extension I came up with, and, and um, uh, you know, I think most of the implementation work, and, uh, and now it's going to be part of Core 5, but going from idea to it's actually useful for people, and now you can say, you know, you can create the value that you can afford and work in line and acquire it. Um, if, if we didn't have this freedom of looseness and extensibility, then it would have been sort of, uh, we might have just given up. It might have been not worth the effort. Could be too long until I took it actually. So what yeah, I what was actually thinking of on your and how really supposed to play it was it's very ironic. But um, my what is actually more um, idiom like where um, some of the problems I've run into that are kind of goofy are like whenever I'm looking at the work coming out of ICC and comparing it to GCC, it's um, Warp, and I'm like, ew, what, what, mm. you know, and I wonder how much of the complexity of um, that you start seeing in debuggers um, actually is dealing with these weird things. I know that the, the people from Total View um, complain regularly about how X compiler does this differently than Y compiler, and because of, and they have to essentially special case these things, and this may even be GCC X and GCC Y, you know? Yeah, I mean, I right. remember from a few years ago those cases, right. which was where, uh, which, I mean, part of the problem in that case was that, you know, the, that everybody else is a black box, so they said, oh, well, we've been special casing GCC X version N uh, because it produces this wrong thing. Uh, we've been doing that for five years. So we that four and a half years ago. Yeah, I remember it was 32 bugs and like 17 right. were actual. One, one of the things that we, we haven't done very well to try to address what you're talking about, idioms, is we have a wiki, and at least in theory, we can put on the wiki um, an answers to how do I describe this? Um, we have a mailing list, Dwarf Discuss, for uh, people who want to talk about, you know, I have this kind of a structure, I'm generating this dwarf, is this right? I'm generating this dwarf, my debugger doesn't like it, who's wrong? Um, and in many, and, in, in at least a couple of those cases, we're actually talking about cases that um, it was a situation where they were both right, but people were looking at the specification with different views. And, and that's what. And sometimes what you need is to to get, as Eric said, the the spec is not, it may be opaque, it's not deliberately incomprehensible, but sometimes you need somebody to say, um, no, that's not what it means. And that's what I'm suggesting as a strategic direction. Yeah, it would be a good thing. We had, um, we had somebody some time ago that sent an email saying, I can't get my debugger to stop anywhere. It doesn't set any breakpoints. And then they showed us what they generated. They never turned on the, the flag in the line table which says set a breakpoint here. There's nothing in the standard which says you should do that. Well, the other thing is, and, you know, the other thing is that this is a case that, yeah. and, well, so I haven't looked at the latest draft, but, you know, a couple years on it. But that's a case also where the standard actually was pretty okay. It's called the is statement flag. Is statement flag. And uh, and it and it doesn't and one gleans that the purpose of this is uh, this is the flag that means I the compiler thinks this is probably what you think is a useful place for a breakpoint. 
The spec does actually say that's what it's taking. Yeah. Actually, we spent many, many, many hours uh, editing uh, the Dwarf 4 document before publishing it. And we, we cleaned up a lot of things that were uh, incompatible, uh, conflicts, unclear. We explained more things. We did a lot of editing work. And geez, you know we find problems in the document after that. We're always going to find things that are less than clear. And we add, you know, we add non-normative text to say, by the way, if you want your debugger to ever stop, you need to sell it someplace there's a statement. Yeah, it, sure, send me, send me notes, write them. We have an issues form. If there's places where you really think it needs an explanation, um, it, it's a balance between clarity, verbosity, being precise, and at some place, um, at, at some point we have to say, if you don't know what you're doing, don't start doing anything, you know. Uh, you, you have to know a little bit about what's going on before you start here. So I don't want to I don't want to turn the the dwarf document into an introductory class in in writing I, I writing debuggers, but, but tell those of us who think we know what we're doing. Tell tell me you know So I mean, sorry, I'm not going to be a much help cuz a couple of years ago I decided I Okay, but I, but for, but for anybody, for anybody, we have this issues um, page on the on the website. Uh, if you see things which are not clear, which you think needs a clarification, it it, it seems to be ambiguous. You know. And it'll be better than arguing about Fortran co arrays. Absolutely, <laughs> we can actually we can actually understand these questions and and resolve them. Although. Although we did come up with an answer to one of them, which is, don't do that. Uh, we we spent a lot of time talking about some some funny thing that was in a, a, a location list and and came to the conclusion that you shouldn't want to do what you did. So uh, you can find the, the the trails of that on our website. That was a zero minus one. That was a zero minus one. We spent a lot of time talking about that to decide to do nothing. Um, what else should we be doing in Dwarf? What, what, how can we make it easier to, to, to generate, and easier to consume? Things that we're doing absolutely wrong? There's five or six different libraries. Yeah. Five or six should different? We, should we supply one or endorse one? For generating oh, for, one? for, for they're all just for seven. Seven. Uh, I've got one too, so. Yeah. Um, Probably not. Probably not. David Anderson with his Live, live Dwarf um, it has. On hmm? So much valid input. Pardon me? It crashes on so much valid input. That's too bad. Um, so that's, uh, yeah. There's been this kind of vague idea floating around that uh, we have this, this stuff in GDB, this, this target agent stuff where you send the code down to the. Uh, the target to execute stuff independently of the debugger. Um, and it's been uh, observed several times that the dwarf byte codes and these ancient byte codes are very much alike. And so the, the obvious idea is that could you actually somehow change, extend the dwarf byte codes in such a way that you could actually send them on a target, have them be a real live evaluation agent. That's an interesting idea. Especially uh, the concept, but, but The idea is actually turning that into something that runs live on a target is kind of weird, so we haven't really done anything on it. Um, By the way, as a note, we are currently into the break. Oh. I have no objection to continuing, but I decided to mention that we're currently into the break right now in case anyone really cares. Okay, thanks. We'll wrap, wrap up in a moment, I guess. Um, that's an interesting, interesting idea. 
the uh, exception handler stuff also uses the dwarf white code interpreter um, as a slight tangent it's not the dwarf exception handler it is dwarf ha exception handler adopting the dwarf CFI information um, I don't know S uh, splitting it out as as the dwarf engine for bytecode interpretation is an interesting idea I'm not not sure how I'm not sure about that but it's an interesting thought I mean, it would be easy to say that's just Yeah. The, the 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 dwarf the dwarf execution engine really is designed just to evaluate expressions to come up with addresses or or values and not not really write complete programs to to do stuff. So it's yeah, so uh, interesting. It may be that Uh, since we are out of time, any final questions or comments? So, I have one final thing. The, the biggest complaint I get is the size of the debug information, especially, again, with the, um, with the meta programming and like the templated classes, which are becoming way more. And so, I think that I Absolutely. the direction that would be nice is if I you added a, a, a logical compressor of some kind into the spec so that these metaprogramming fundamentals could be expressed in a much more dense way. We, and I know you've okay. some steps. Mm, that's, that's an interesting idea. Um, <coughs> we, we have several ways of doing compression. We have the dwarf fission. Uh, the idea of Compacting the, are are you talking about uh, function signatures? I'm not. More, um, what I'm thinking of is, since we're using a kind of meta programming, um, there is a logical, um, a logical block that is repeated over and over again, and so having um, having something, some sort of representation that could be alluded to um, um, and expanded in much the same way templates are actually we, expanded. We do have type merging. The, well, but that's, I mean, all that's, 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 that's not. Be, There's an explosion of expansion of the templates. But if you read the, the spec in a general way, then the importing of the puzzle unit stuff can, can be used. Can some of the, okay. For, you know, for, uh, to deduplicate any part of the tree. I, I think that's. I, I think that's an interesting idea. I don't know about the meta programming aspect of it, but we really do have a problem with C plus plus and template explosions. So. so I, what I was thinking is essentially something like a template um, representing a logical template in in words. We don't. We like don't want. We want dwarf to be 
be the compiler describing what it did, not Dwarf being a compiler in and of itself. In and of itself. So we don't want the debug, a debugger to have to... What we're trying to do is make explicit all the interactions between the producer and the consumer. We don't want to have this implicit, um, I know how to generate these things from, from a template. So yeah, you, you that are, that, are, that are more along the lines of explicit, you know, compression where you, you know, which, which there are some some facilities for and maybe maybe we need others. And then so but where you know, where in a dense way it says this is equivalent yeah. to this much better uh or uh tree that you might have that I think. And yours, it's just oh, good. Thank you. Uh, 